You're listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. Welcome back to our Atopic Dermatitis and Skin of Color series in partnership with the Allergy and Asthma Network. Today, we're going to talk about skincare strategies for atopic dermatitis in all skin colors. These are things that you can do in your everyday life to help maintain a healthy skin barrier. We're going to talk about treatments, so things like steroids, medication, biologics, and a few other things in our next episode. So if you're waiting and hoping to hear about that, it's coming, don't worry. In this episode, again, we're going to be talking about skincare strategies. If this is your first time listening in, this is three of five episodes we're doing. If you need a little bit of an introduction, you can check out our first episode, which is Understanding Atopic Dermatitis and Skin of Color, and our second episode, which is Diagnosing AD and Skin of Color. Since we have a lot to talk about in this episode, check out series one and two, because that's where you'll get your foundational understanding. So let's jump into it. Dr. G, can you quickly review how skin and people with atopic dermatitis, which actually is also known as eczema or AD, so we'll be using those words interchangeably in this episode. Can you tell us why skin and people with AD is different and why it needs all of the moisturizing it can get? Yes. So there's been a lot of research done on the skin barrier, and it's thought that eczema leads to the skin being leaky. So the amount of water and moisture in the skin is actually less. And some people have a defect in a gene that's found in the skin called filaggrin. A deficiency in filaggrin leads to a leaky skin barrier again that allows higher than normal water loss and leads to the dry scaly skin and also allows allergens to enter through the epidermis or the top layer of the skin where they trigger an allergic immune response and that causes inflammation. So when your skin is dry, irritated, inflamed, that causes the sensation of itching. And with an allergic trigger, you also have the release of histamine that also causes itching. So this starts the itch, scratch, rash cycle, as we like to call it, where the skin starts to itch, then you scratch it to the point of where it's very red and inflamed, and that causes more itching, and that causes a rash, and so on and so on. So the key in eczema treatment is interrupting this itch, scratch, rash cycle with the goal of healing the skin barrier. How do you avoid this itch, scratch, rash cycle? What can we do to prevent that? Yeah, so the most important part of all of this is keeping that skin barrier intact, which is harder to do in patients with eczema because of everything we just spoke about with the flagrant gene. And just that is really the issue with eczema is that that skin barrier is just more compromised and doesn't hold moisture as easily. So we need to keep our skin hydrated externally by drinking lots of water and making sure that we are being gentle with the skin. It starts with bathing. We want to keep our skin clean, but we don't want to overdo it. So we don't want to use harsh soaps, soaps with too many ingredients or anything with fragrance. You don't want to use a harsh loofah, for example, or other tools to scrub the skin. You just want to use your hands or a very gentle towel or other loofahs that can be gentle. And I would avoid anything that says scrub in the description of the body wash that you're using. So you want to also use cold water if you can, but never hot. So lukewarm is probably the best for most people because not many people can take cold showers, but hot water is drying to the skin. And so that's why we want to avoid too high temperatures. It's going to dry out the skin and cause that irritation, dryness, and then again, the itch. Once you're out of the shower, or bath, you want to pat your skin and again, not rub it hard and not rub it dry. You want to pat it dry. And lastly, you want to put on moisturizers while your skin is still a little moist 
from the water because this will help the creams or lotions or ointments get into the slightly open pores and penetrate into the skin as the skin is drying. What I'm hearing is that you do not want to break your skin barrier. So unfortunately for us AD people, no sugar scrubs. What I'm also hearing, which is interesting to me, is that being hydrated does not mean chilling out in the bath for hours. It actually means lathering yourself in a healthy amount of moisturizer so that you seal in the hydration for your skin. So when you hear hydrate, or at least when I hear hydrate, I think water, 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 but it's actually keeping that water in. And that's what creams and lotions do. So is there anything that people with skin of color should note about moisturizing? Yes. So we mentioned this in an earlier episode, but research is actually showing that patients with skin of color have differences in that top layer of their skin or their epidermal structure. It is especially important to go the extra mile to use the best possible moisturizing agents and barrier repair strategies to treat atopic dermatitis in patients with skin of color, particularly those with African ancestry. We want to ensure that we are doing all that we can to improve that barrier in these patients. And are all moisturizers made equal? So with respect to cleansers and moisturization, I recommend patients use moisturizing cleansers as opposed to traditional soaps, which can dry the skin excessively. So there's something called a Sindet bars and moisturizing liquid cleansers with occlusives and humectants built in that can minimize any drying of the skin while showering or bathing. So Sindet bars are made differently from regular soap bars and are derived from oils, fats, or petroleum products rather than traditional soap. Companies that make Sindet bars are Dove, Cetaphil, Eucerin. Lotions are thicker than a solution. Creams are even thicker and ointments are even thicker and therefore they're greasier and Sometimes they're not as well tolerated by people because of their consistency. But to be honest, those are most often commonly used when the eczema gets more severe and they work the best. And so again, the lotions and creams that you should use shouldn't have any fragrance. I definitely use a greasy ointment and I am a shiny, shiny person. But at the end of the day, my skin is happy and I'm a happy person. I also use an oil-based body wash and I don't use soap at all. And it was hard to get used to because, you know, you're not getting that squeaky clean feeling, but your skin is really softer. And I guess that's the goal is that we want to have really moisturized, soft skin and not like squeaky clean because squeaky clean generally means dry for me and maybe the same for you guys. So I'm curious, since we can't use fragrances and essentially smell super nice. What about using perfume? Yeah, so perfumes can also be irritating to the skin because they contain fragrance mix, which we test often for people who have what we call contact dermatitis. And I would recommend staying away from them if possible. But, you know, I personally have been gifted perfumes and I have eczema. And so what I do as a trick, first, I put the back of my neck as a test spot and keep it on for the day and make sure that I don't have a reaction. And the second thing I do is I actually apply it to my clothes as opposed to putting it directly on my skin. And that might make a difference. Okay, that's a good tip. Thank you. In case we want to smell divine one day. So before we jump into other ways to manage your atopic dermatitis, other than what you can actually do for and onto your skin, I was told by my dermatologist that I can never moisturize too much. What do you say about that? Yes, I absolutely agree with that statement. If you are using a product that you do well with, then applying it throughout the day is the ideal way to keep your skin hydrated, but that's hard for people to do because they're in school, they're working, just gets cumbersome, especially if you have a large area of your body that's affected. But I would say that for a lot of people, the hands can be problematic because we're washing them often. So at least re-moisturizing your hands throughout the day after you wash them is a good baseline to try to get used to. And a little pro tip is if you can keep a little moisturizer in all different places of your house. So on your desk, by your door, anywhere where you think, okay, I might need to moisturize. 
that helps me definitely with the hands. So now we have our skincare routine down and outside of medication, of course, which we'll cover in the next episode. What are other ways we can help maintain a healthy skin barrier? A big question would be, what does environment have to do with it? And before Dr. G tells us a little bit more about environment, we've been talking with Shiv and she has participated in our first two episodes and she's participating again in this one. And she talks to us a little bit about how she moved cities and how by moving cities, her skin improved. And I know that that happens to me, but the opposite way. So I moved cities and my skin got worse. So let's hear from Shiv and then we can jump into a little bit more about how environment can impact your atopic dermatitis. I'm constantly reapplying my creams. I keep one on me. I moisturize with my uh, full body cream multiple times a day, but I have this trusty cream that I moisturize the bad spots all the time. And I think the best thing for me was moving. Uh, it really helped with the flare-ups. I, didn't, I don't have them as uh, often. And yeah, so it's just doing those things. Yeah, so this was a great clip in showing how environment can play a really big role in atopic dermatitis. We discussed triggers in our first episode and knowing what your triggers are by getting tested can help. But triggers like pollen, pet dander, all these things are environmental triggers. So moving can be tricky because you may be allergic to a pollen in your new city or you may be less allergic to pollens in your area, or you may become allergic to new pollens as you live in your new city longer. So I don't think it's practical to move for your allergies necessarily because of pollen, but I have seen patients move their apartment because of smoke exposure from a neighbor that triggers their asthma, for example, or if there are animals in the building that someone is allergic to and is triggering all of their atopic symptoms, including atopic dermatitis. There's little tricks that you can do if you are allergic to the environment outside to help prevent the symptoms from getting severe. One of these things is air purifiers. They can help with these airborne triggers by removing some of these allergens. Or if you're allergic to a pet, you want to make sure to keep that pet outside of your sleeping area to prevent being exposed to that allergen for seven to eight hours while you sleep. And then we'll be talking about this more in the next episode, but there's also immunotherapy to decrease the sensitivity that you have to different allergens that you can think about if you are being triggered by environmental allergies. So you mentioned sleep, and I'd love to just jump into that really quickly because I feel like sleep and atopic dermatitis go hand in hand. And by that, I mean, sometimes you can't sleep because of it. Are there things that we can do to our environment to help with sleep or that people should be aware of? Yeah, so nighttime symptoms are actually very common in a lot of allergic conditions, including atopic dermatitis, asthma, because when we're laying still, we're able to feel the sensations of our body more than when we're running around doing things and our mind is preoccupied. And so you want to keep that in mind that your nighttime symptoms may be worse and it's because of that partially. But other things that you can do is keeping your room cool, which is very important. As I said, heat causes the skin to become dry and that causes it to be, feel itchy. And then also sweating can affect the skin and be an irritant. In addition, keeping the humidity levels at around 40 to 50%, but not higher is a good rule of thumb. Too little humidity causes the skin to get dry and too much results in dust mites thriving and the possibility of mold growth in your environment, which as we know, can both be triggers for atopic dermatitis. And so with pollen allergies, you can also keep your windows shut to protect your bedroom and living space from having pollen covered sofas and beds. What about things in the house like curtains or carpets? I know these are things I look out for, for my asthma triggers. Is it the same for eczema? Any allergic person should try to be in an environment with as few carpets or curtains as possible, but that's not always possible. So if you are in a home with lots of curtains and carpets and things, you just need to make sure that you're taking care of cleaning these areas so that you're limiting the amount of dust mites and other triggers that can get into the carpeting and the curtains. 
And not every vacuum is made the same. So if you are looking for a new vacuum, make sure it's got a good HEPA filter so that you aren't just like spreading more dusty stuff all over your house. That's one tip that I can definitely also add in. And since we're talking a little bit about cleaning, what about the actual products you use? Should we also be watching out for those? Yes. So using harsh chemicals, but absolutely can be problematic in what we're cleaning our house with. We want to make sure that we are wearing gloves while we're cleaning as any cleaning agent, even if gentle can be irritating to the skin. Next, I try to use again, fragrance-free products for cleaning also, and make sure that you're diluting cleaning agents like bleach as recommended. So I've seen people use just pure bleach to clean. And that's really not how it's meant to be used. And I think especially with the recent pandemic, I think that people have become overly obsessed with keeping things clean. And so again, using bleach products without diluting them is dangerous for the person who's using the products and also for the people who are in the environment after the cleaning is done. And then I also wanted to make a quick point about hand sanitizers because they are alcohol-based and can also be very drying to the skin. So you want to be careful about hand sanitizers if you have sensitive skin, because they are most likely not going to be good for your skin. That's so nice to hear, because I know that during the pandemic, whenever we were going into certain shops, they wanted us to sanitize our hands. And I was like, I just can't do that. I have you know, I have pretty bad eggs on my hands, especially in the winter. And it was kind of a weird conversation to have with someone being like, I'm sorry, I really I won't touch anything. But I can't use that hand sanitizer because my skin's just much too sensitive. And I can wear gloves if you want me to like my winter gloves, and I won't touch anything. I promise it was kind of a weird thing. So thank you for saying that about hand sanitizer, because I think that sometimes we feel like we have to use it, even though it's not going to be good for us. Uh, And I also just wanted to note that gloves are really helpful for cooking too. If certain things trigger your hand eczema, I know that certain like acidic foods can be a problem. So we always have a box of gloves in our house. I also wanted to ask you because I've been doing this lately is I've been on a bit of a shopping spree for non itchy clothes. The summer has been just epic for me and I feel like my clothes are just being very bothersome. So can we also consider our clothing is something that might impact our atopic dermatitis? Yes. Clothing is super close to our skin, so it can definitely affect your skin. You want to stay away from anything that can be harsh on your skin. I personally cannot wear wool sweaters in the winter, for example, because they're very itchy and I will get a rash and be uncomfortable. So I would recommend soft materials like cotton, is honestly the best. And if you do want to wear that wool sweater, you could wear a cotton shirt underneath and then put the wool sweater over. Also synthetic materials like polyester can aggravate the skin. And then lastly, tight clothing can be irritating for people with eczema because it can cause that rubbing and it can cause that friction that causes the skin to be more itchy. Yes, about the rubbing. I know that sometimes I wear certain shirts inside out And I cut off all tags, all tags, because those are little nasty rubbers. If you can say that, I don't know if that sounded weird, but yeah, I definitely agree. And I think cutting off all your tags, no matter what age you are, is a good thing to do. We've talked about house and we've talked about clothing, and these are things we can control around us. One trigger that's much harder to control is stress. So one thing that I'd like to mention, because we're trying to highlight certain things, for patients with skin of color and atopic dermatitis is that in skin of color, as we mentioned in episode one, we find that their disease is worse. And therefore with worse disease, you have worse itching, you have worse skin issues like discoloration, the hypopigmentation, the hyperpigmentation we've discussed. And all of those things can lead to increased levels of stress and stress related to the condition. And so, and that vicious cycle kind of repeating itself. So I want to highlight the importance of really finding ways to manage stress, especially in patients that have more severe disease. Shiv was brave enough to open up about her and her mother's experience in managing her atopic dermatitis, which we will share with you now. 
I've dealt with a lot in the past with negative comments and sometimes I react badly to it and sometimes I like to just brush it aside but I've actually gone to therapy since I was small because of some people's comments. I was bullied by my older sister's friends, but my worst experience which impacted me the most would be when I was five or six years old. I remember going to ballet classes and when we were all changing into our tutus, the other kids would just stare or move away from me. Now that I'm older, I can understand that because of the lack of awareness around AD, they assumed I was contagious. But back then, the most hurtful thing to witness is someone you're just trying to be friends with running away scared each time you go near them. I joined gymnastics as well, and the same thing occurred. I ended up quitting both sports, but the best thing that I could ever do was go to therapy. My mom and I both went to therapy because eczema doesn't only affect the patient, but the whole family as well. It really helped build my confidence and explain the reason why the kids reacted that way and that it wasn't my fault in any way. My mom was affected a lot when I was going through that crucial, um, that first severe stage when I was around three years old. Seeing your child waking up bleeding and screaming and crying really impacted her. It got to a point where they advised her to step away from me, let my dad and my granny help dress me and clean my bandages out because they said I could sense my mom's stress and my mom's being upset that in turn make me stressed and make me flare. So she was very emotional and I could pick up on that. So she also had to go to therapy and had to get more stronger in how she deals with me. And she taught me a lot about positivity and taking like, you know, making lemonade out of lemons so this is a main thing of how I started my social media platform really bringing that positivity in what she taught me and seeing the backstory about how she also dealt with it and had to learn coping mechanisms and really utilizing that seeing it from the patient as well as the whole family I also know that my sisters even though they have very mild eczema they still were impacted by my eczema and my journey. And even my dad, who's very quiet and silent, he was impacted in his own way. So it really impacts the whole family. So Shiv brings up such an important topic. Going to therapy can not only help you understand how you might be able to look at your stressors differently, but can also just help us figure out what those stressors actually are. Because sometimes we don't even know what is affecting us and how life is affecting us and causing us to be stressed. So sometimes just talking about it can help us realize what exactly is causing the stress. Sometimes stress can cause the condition, but also sometimes stress can be caused by the condition, which is what we saw for Shiv and her family. Her mom watching Shiv have this condition really caused a lot of stress for her. And that turned into a vicious cycle because then it ultimately led to stress for Shiv. So it really sounds like therapy and family therapy allowed them to put into place alternative ways in which to manage their condition at home. You know, separating mom during times of high stress so that both her and mom could step away and hopefully ultimately improve her condition. Yeah, I think that was so good to hear from Shiv. And family and friends are really important in the process of dealing with a chronic condition. I mean, you really don't have to go at it alone and your family or friends are also impacted. Like you said, Shiv's mom is obviously impacted from her AD. I know that personally, when I started to share how my skin made me feel not just physically on the outside, but also emotionally, I started to gain more confidence and just to be in my body and talking about what was going on can be a great release. And it was a great release for me in times of high stress. If I told someone how I was feeling, I felt a little bit less stressed because really at the end of the day, you're bottling it up and bottling it up is not a great coping strategy. And I also know that there are some really good online communities. If you know, family and friends aren't really connecting with you and they're not helping you along in your journey and Shiv for instance has a great community where she's really normalizing life with eczema and helping other people feel more comfortable and confident in your skin so if you are looking for someone to help you along you can maybe start with Shiv as well Yes. And knowing that others, as you said, are experiencing similar issues is very important and helping us 
feel like we are not alone, but it is also important to make sure that we're in communities online, especially that are positive, like Shiv and like you. As we all know, social media can also be harmful if we get into the wrong circles and it can actually lead to negative emotions. So we just want to be very, very careful. Yes, you have to vet your information. That's so true because it also can be kind of triggering. I do have to say, as much as family and friends are really important, sometimes I just need to be alone and to deal with my demons, if you will. And I know things that have helped me are meditation, which I couldn't get behind at the beginning. And I was like, I don't understand why people do this. But actually, if you stick with it, it truly can help your eczema. Uh, So meditation, I also know that breathing exercises and yoga have been really important tools for me in managing my stress and in managing my atopic dermatitis. Yeah, and we actually addressed these tools in another series we did with the Asthma and Allergy Network for asthma. And so we'll link to that episode in our show notes because I think that all of those concepts are very pertinent to any condition, but definitely to atopic dermatitis. But essentially, we know from research that meditation and exercise in whatever form you want can be very therapeutic and can help lower stress levels for most people. So if you want to hear more details on how these tools are helpful, we will link the episode in our show notes. We did the episode with a yoga instructor and she reviews some basic techniques that you can actually try as a beginner from home. And I just really want to quickly mention one more time because they are episodes based on asthma, but they are also very relatable for eczema because I know that meditation and yoga and breathing have helped me really break that itch itch, scratch, rash cycle, because sometimes you get into a scratch trance. You just can't stop and you need something to just kick you out of that. And meditation and breathing have helped me just calm myself, put myself into my body and then remove my fingernails away from the parts of my body that are itchy. Before we round out this episode, I do want to share a few other techniques about the itch, scratch cycle that helped me because I can, like I said, get into this, a scratch rage, scratch trance where I just can't stop. It's amazing. My brain just turns off and my hands just go at it. So things like light exercise, like going for a walk, just moving my body slightly helps me. Also things that kind of occupy your mind. So puzzling has been really helpful. I'll listen to a podcast then I'll puzzle. I know some people like to knit or bake. Basically, you just want to occupy your hands. And last thing is watching TV is great. If you find that you watch TV and then you unconsciously start to scratch, have something in your hand that you can play with like a fidget spinner or there's like these pop things. I don't know. They're like these silicone things that you pop, Um, but just something so that your hands aren't going at it without you realizing it. And hopefully that will help you prevent that itch, scratch, rash cycle, because at the end of the day, we want to keep our skin as intact as possible. Those are great tips, Court, and I actually love all the content that you share on your social media accounts and that Shiv shares on her social media accounts to really help patients understand what you do to help your eczema on a daily basis. And it's nice that you guys share those little tips and tricks. Hopefully they can be helpful to those beginner eczema patients. Thanks. Yeah, sometimes people don't realize that living with atopic dermatitis is something that you have to manage every day. And once you find those strategies, it feels less and less like a a big thing and a big part of your life because you've got it managed, but it's about getting control first. So with that, we're going to say thank you for listening. And we hope that you have found some new ways to manage your atopic dermatitis in daily life that doesn't involve medication because that's what we're talking about next time. For now, check out parts one and two in this Atopic Dermatitis with Skin of Color series and go to our show notes for more information about the Allergy and Asthma Network, Shiv, and some other episodes that you might want to listen to about eczema. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, 
or check out our website, which is www.itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.